Good evening. Thank you for joining tonight for prayer and devotion. Pastor will be here in just a moment to open God's word for us. Listen, we've got a lot of things to pray through tonight, so uh, I'm going to keep my words short, and let's dive right in, and let's speak to the Lord together. And I'm just so grateful that we can join together in this way to be able to speak to our Heavenly Father. Would you bow your heads with me, and let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak to you as our loving Father. Lord, thank you that you know us. Uh, Lord, we thank you that, Jesus, you walk this planet that you created, and you experienced joy, you experienced heartbreak, you experienced political dissension, you experienced all the things that happen uh, that we do in our lives, yet the Bible tells us that you did all these things without sin. And that we can come to you as one who knows exactly what our lives are like. Just our daily mundane lives to the bigger things, to things that we struggle with, temptations. So Jesus, thank you. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you. We ask you to continue to lead us, Lord. Help us to find our confidence in you. And then to take steps forward that are pleasing to you, God. So Lord, thank you for leading us during this season. God, we come to you as a church family tonight and we lift up a number of things to you. One that I would want to mention, God, is just thank you for the blessing of the DiGiacomo family. Lord, we thank you for Dr. Jeff and his willingness to move into this role as associate executive pastor. And so we pray, God, that you would continue to lead him as he guides his family and that as we continue in ministry here together at Quill Springs Baptist Church, we thank you for that blessing. Lord, I also lift up to you the joy that we have with the Bone family, Dylan and Brittany, and being able to welcome this new boy into the world noble. So God, we pray that you would double their joy, and we thank you that we get to celebrate life with them as their church family. God, we're also mindful of those that are walking through very difficult times, including grief of death and loss. So God, we pray for Ray Holland in the passing of his mother. Uh, Lord, we lift up to you Edie Mae Permeter in the passing of Don. And just uh, what a dynamic uh, gentleman he was, Lord. And so we know that he is walking with you today, but we pray that you'd surround your arms, Lord, around that family as they grieve. Lord, for the family of Joy A. Duddle Peevler, Lord, we pray for the A. Duddles that you would bless them, Lord, help them to be able to walk through this season of grief with Joy's passing. Lord, we also lift up to you those that are facing personal crises or difficulties, that you would help them, Lord, to be able to walk through these days ahead. We lift up to you and pray that you give strength to Sue Douglas and Debbie Lee and Joe McGuire. Uh, Doris Morse, that you would give her courage. Lord, we pray that you continue to show your power to Fern Bridges and J.D. Cunningham's family, to Rita Geiger, to Deborah Hobbs, Lord. We lift up all these brothers and sisters to you, Father, knowing uh, that we are called to walk alongside and bear one another's burdens. So God, we link arms tonight, and we do that very thing in lifting up these to you. God, we also pray, and I thank you for a, a sweet time of prayer that happened this week here at the church, led by Chris Doyle, to pray that COVID-19 would move on. And so, Lord, we ask you to do that. We don't know what that's going to look like or how that would look, but we know you, and you are the ultimate. You are the one in control with your sovereignty, with your power as a great physician, so we turn to you, Lord, and we ask you uh, to bring relief to this coronavirus. Be with those that are serving on the front lines. Uh, be with those families that are dealing with it directly. I know in my uh, own past in church life, I pray for the Garland family, that you would be with them, Lord, in particular. Uh, God, we just ask that you would move there and, and help that to pass on by again. God, we pray for our nation. We pray for our state. We pray for our city. God, I pray and we pray for our own neighbors. 
Lord, there, there is much turmoil, and, and it's almost as if the heat's being turned up as we move towards elections. But God, I pray that you'd help each of us to be mindful that individually we are ambassadors right outside our own front door to be image bearers, to be people of peace, to be people of, of confidence, to be people of the gospel, the good news, to be people of repentance, uh, to be people of mercy and grace and justice. So God, help us, Lord, uh, to be salt and light in our community over these next few weeks in particular. And we trust you, Lord. We trust your sovereignty in all things, in all things that we've mentioned tonight, Lord. Our faith is in you. And we thank you, Lord, for the promise that we find in Scripture, the promise of eternity. Lord, we pray and we ask all these things in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm thankful that we can gather around the Word of God together this evening. I want you to take your Bible, if you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And tonight, as we continue to talk about trials in the Bible, I want to talk to you about the trial of Jesus in the wilderness. Some time ago, I was in the home of a friend of mine, and in his study, he had biography after biography, after biography. He just read as many books as he could about the lives of great men and women. And so seeing that sort of inspired me to start reading the life stories of different people. And I love doing that, whether I'm reading the biography of a preacher or a musician or a politician or a businessman or an athlete. I enjoy reading biographies because I make an assumption. Anybody who gets a biography written about them must have either done something really well or have done something really bad and so i read the book and i ask the question what was his secret how did she do it what made this person such a great success or failure and as much as i enjoy reading biographies i love autobiographies even more as someone tells their own story because you can really see into their heart and their motivation and who they were and so tonight we're going to look at an autobiographical passage we're going to look at the story of jesus as he was tempted by satan in the wilderness and i say that it was an autobiograph autobiographical passage because jesus was by himself facing satan in the wilderness matthew who wrote matthew's gospel wasn't there none of the gospel writers would have been there jesus was by himself and so that tells me that what we read is what jesus described to his own disciples about what he experience the story of jesus temptation when he was alone in the wilderness is a powerful glimpse into the inner life of the son of god it's a spiritual autobiography and i can imagine him gathering his disciples around him and telling them how he faced temptation in the wilderness and how he won and the story of jesus and his trial by satan in the wilderness is a reminder to us and a lesson for us about how we can face temptation and win. So begin reading with me in Matthew chapter 4. We'll begin by reading verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. And so the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God took Jesus, the Son of God, out into the wilderness. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted. He was very, very hungry. And then at that moment, Satan came and began to tempt him. Now, the Bible introduces or talks about Satan here as the tempter. That's one of the descriptive names and titles of Satan in Scripture. We're not told what form Satan may have taken he may have taken a physical form or it simply may have been a voice that was speaking to Jesus. But the battle with Jesus was direct and personal as Jesus faced the devil in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted so that every creature in heaven, on earth, and under the earth can know that Jesus Christ is the one and the only one who has conquered Satan. He exposed Satan and his tactics. He defeated Satan. And because of his victory, 
you and I can have victory together over the tempter today. So I want us to think about three different temptations that Jesus faced and how we can withstand those same temptations through the power of Jesus Christ. First of all, think with me about resisting Satan's self-provision temptation. The self-provision temptation. Now read with me in verses 3 and 4 of our text. The Bible says, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones, or command that these stones become bread. Now we'll stop right there. He says, If you are the Son of God. It's important to understand, Satan was not really questioning whether Jesus was the Son of God. He was assuming and asserting that Jesus was the Son of God. The word if there in verse 3 could be translated since. Since you are the Son of God, Jesus, command that these stones become bread. Jesus, you're out here in the wilderness. You've gone 40 days and 40 nights without anything to eat, and there are these stones here in front of us. Since you can do anything, since you can transform anything, since you, with, you, you uphold the whole universe by your power as the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Well, what did Jesus say? The Bible says in verse 4, He answered and said, It is written, and in the original language, it's even stronger than that, It stands written. God has said this, and it will never change. That's what Jesus was saying. It stands written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He quotes to Satan from the book of Deuteronomy. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Think about Satan's temptation to Jesus. It wasn't just that he was hungry. It wasn't just that he needed something to eat. The deeper temptation was Satan's appeal to Jesus' right as the Son of God to be able to provide for himself. It's as though Satan were saying, Jesus, why should you starve out here in the wilderness if you really are God's Son? After all, God provided for the children of Israel while they were in the wilderness, even when they were rebellious and sinful. God took care of them every day and provided manna for them in the wilderness surely you as the son of god deserve to be able to take these stones and turn them into bread so that you can provide for yourself why don't you provide for yourself jesus at the expense of obedience to the father and jesus says no that's not the way it works man doesn't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god you know there are going to be times when we face times of need and want and we wonder how we're going to make it to the next day or we think we can we think we can get an advantage by doing something that's wrong and satan will come and tempt us to provide for ourselves it's like the story i heard one time about a young man and a young lady who were just beginning to date one another they were out to dinner one night and the young woman asked the young man she said hey if somebody paid you a million dollars would you tell a lie and he said for a million dollars she said yeah he said absolutely i'd tell a lie for a million dollars she said well would you tell a lie for a dollar and he said well no what kind of person do you think i am she said well we've already established what kind of person you are i'm just trying to establish what your lowest price is you know there's going to come a time in all of our lives where we say hey here i am in need here i am hungry here i am and i can't pay the rent here i am and i i can't get the basic necessities of my life, but I can provide for myself if I simply do something or say something to sin against God. Won't God understand that? And when we're rationalizing sin in that way, Satan will come and whisper in our ears and say, sure, God will understand. He sees what you're experiencing. and He knows what you need, so sure, it's okay for you to do what you have to do. But the truth is, it's never right to do the wrong thing and no matter what our need may be that need never causes us to have to sin against god in fact the word of god promises that god will supply our needs as we trust in him the book of philippians says my god shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in christ jesus something i've learned is this if i need it God will supply it. And if God doesn't supply it, I don't need it. And the truth is, when I'm trusting in Him and I'm walking with Him, He will take care of me. And I can obey Him trusting 
that he'll take care of my needs and that I don't have to provide for myself at the expense of disobeying him. And so we see him talking about resisting Satan's self-provision temptation. But then secondly, Jesus talks about resisting Satan's self-protection temptation. Now read with me in verse 5 of the text. The Bible says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, into the city of Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Bible scholars and archaeologists aren't really sure where the pinnacle of the temple was. If you go to Jerusalem today, they'll show you a point there on the temple mount facing the Kidron Valley that many people believe may have been the pinnacle of the temple. Some people believe that it was a, uh, the top, the rooftop of, of a porch there on the, on the uh, temple mount. We're really not sure. Church historians tell us that James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, was killed by being thrown down from the pinnacle of Herod's temple. And Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, says that the distance from the pinnacle of the temple down to the bottom of the valley below was 450 feet. So we don't know exactly where it was, but it was a place that was high up and where there was a long fall down. And so the Bible says the devil took Jesus up into the city of Jerusalem and then set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, again, since you're God's son, throw yourself down for it is written. Isn't that amazing? Satan can get into the act of quoting scripture as well. It's as though he were saying, Jesus, I can tell that you're a student of the Bible and you quoted that verse to me from Deuteronomy. So I've been reading in the book of Psalms and let me just read to you something that I read about the Messiah and you're the Messiah. So let me tell you what I read about the Messiah in the book of Psalms. It is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So he takes him to this high place. He quotes scripture to him that says, the angels are going to keep you from falling and they're going to bear you up so that you don't dash your foot on a stone, much less your whole body. So why don't you throw yourself down? Why don't you just test this out, Jesus? Because you're going to be in dangerous positions as you do what God's called you to do here on earth. Why don't you throw yourself down and see and check it out and see if God will protect you? Look again in verse 7. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He answered scripture with scripture. Jesus introduced a very important principle for when we study our Bible, which is not only to trust the word of God completely, but also to use scripture to interpret scripture. Never take a verse out of context, but rather interpret it by using other verses and using the whole Bible uh, to, to understand each verse of the Bible. When you take the Bible as a whole, the Bible will always provide for a consistent and God-trusting way of life. And so he said, you shall not tempt, you shall not put to the test the Lord your God. Some people, some Christians, have an attitude before God that says, God, I can't really trust you until I have first tested you. But God wants us to simply trust him and not put him to the test. Imagine buying a car with an incredible airbag system. It's got airbag and airbags in the front and the sides and every angle protected. But then you decide before you can trust those airbags that you have to test them. And so you put your own crash test dummy into the driver's seat of the car and you tie a brick to the accelerator and somehow you manage to send that car speeding toward a brick wall at 55 miles per hour just to test the airbags well you wouldn't do that you you buy the car and you trust that those airbags are there it's foolish to put something to the test when you know it can be trusted god says that he wants us to trust him and not to test him. And so we have to be really careful when God calls us to do something that we don't put God to the test. Now let me tell you how we do it sometimes. Sometimes we'll say, Lord, I know you're calling me to obey you in this area. I know you're calling me to this area of service or ministry. Maybe you're calling me to a, a new position or a new place or some new activity that I know you're calling me to do. But God, before I can really trust you with that, 
let me set up some hoops for you to jump through, God. And if you'll just jump through all these hoops that I've given you to jump through, and if you do it the way I want you to do it, God, then I'll know that you're really in it and that I can trust you, and then I'll begin to obey. We want to protect ourselves. And when we do that, Satan again will come and whisper in your ear and say, that's exactly right. You need to put God to the test. You need to test this out before you get out on the road. And I'll, I'll t Satan will say, I'll even help you set up the hoops and show you exactly where God needs to jump through. Just give him some tests. Listen, God does not need us to test him. God desires for us to trust him. So you come before God. And you trust him. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Without faith or without trust. It is impossible to please God. For everyone who comes to God must believe or have faith. That he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is looking for believers who will trust him enough to obey him. And so Jesus passed the self provision test and then he passed the self-protection test but then there's a third test that he describes he talks about resisting satan's self-promotion temptation the temptation to promote ourselves look again in verses eight and nine of the text the bible says again the devil took jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, all of the wealth, all of the riches, all of the power of all of the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. This was one final desperate attempt to tempt Jesus. And this must have happened in the spiritual realm. I, I don't know exactly how everything was happening here, but this had to have happened in the spiritual realm because there's no mountain on earth where you could see all of the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory at once. And yet that's what Satan showed Jesus. He showed him a vision of the world in which the nations stood ready to abandon everything else and to accept Christ as Lord. That's what he was saying. I'm going to give you all of these kingdoms. They're all going to fall down and worship you. Jesus could hear the rustling of flags as he enjoyed peace and power with no sacrifice. That's what Satan was offering. Because see, Jesus came to die on the cross. He came to receive all the glory by dying on the cross for our sins. But Satan said, hey, I'll give you all the glory without a cross. No pain. No Gethsemane. No cross. No nails. No crown of thorns. No thirst. No mocking. No, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of the kingdoms of the world could have been his immediately. Satan says, I'll give you all of this if you will fall down and worship me. It was the temptation to self-promotion. Satan comes at us that way. He'll say, listen, I can give you what you want. Just let me know what, what you need to be successful, and I can make it happen for you. In the world of business, just ask a few of the dishonest men and women who are millionaires. I did it for them, he'll say. In the world of politics, just look at a few men and women that are in high positions of power. I did it for them. Look in the world of fame, and, and just for a few of these immoral movie stars, you can see what I did for them, and I can do it for you. In the world of religion, just ask a few compromising preachers how I gave them success. I can give it to you. All you have to do, he'll say, is to do things his way. And Satan can deliver for you. But remember, there's always a price. An old preacher once said, Satan always pays his bills in counterfeit money. When he offers you something, he will always get a higher price from you than what you would be willing to pay. So what did Jesus do? Verse 10 and verse 11. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And then the Bible says at that, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to Jesus. What did Jesus do? He sent Satan away. He lifted up the Lord God above everything else and said, I will only serve him, and I will only worship him. He resisted the devil 
and the devil fled away. So what are a few things that we can remember when we face temptation? As we finish up tonight, think about this. First of all, we experience the same kinds of temptations that Jesus faced. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. We experience the same temptations that Jesus faced. He experienced the same kinds of temptations that we face. And so he's sympathetic to our weaknesses, and he can give us power to overcome those weaknesses. Something else for us to remember. We face and we risk the same danger. There is always a great danger when we face temptation. The Bible talks about it in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, where the Word of God says, Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Death always comes along with sin. It might be the death of a relationship. It might be the death of your testimony. It might be physical death. Of course, if we never trust Christ as our Savior and we die in our sins, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. There is a risk that we face when we're tempted to sin. Then something else we can remember when we face temptations. We face the same choice. Jesus chose to resist Satan, and we can make that same choice. Again, in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's what Jesus did. He submitted himself to God and to God's word. He resisted the devil, and the devil went away. The devil left him alone. When we submit ourselves to God and his word, when we resist the devil and the power of the Holy Spirit, the devil will flee from us. Next, we enjoy the same opportunity that Jesus had. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. At every point, God provided a way for Jesus to escape the temptation. And that provision came through His Word and His truth. When we're walking in the Word of God, and when we're relying on the truth of God, God will always provide for us a way of escape when temptation comes. And then one other thing that we see that we share with Jesus, we possess the same weapon that Jesus possessed. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 17. The Word of God says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So when the devil comes and he's scheming and planning and trying to tempt us, the Bible says, Put on the whole armor of God. And then in verse 17 it says this, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This book, the Word of God, is the sword with which we can defeat Satan. Think about what Jesus did as he faced these temptations. Over and over again, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Jesus faced Satan and won, and so can we. We can stand on the Word of God, in the power of the Word of God, and we can defeat Satan because the Son of God has already defeated him. Now, there was something that Jesus could have done that he didn't do. He could have zapped the devil with supernatural lightning and just obliterated him. He didn't. Instead, he faced Satan's temptations with the same spiritual resources that you and I have today. He used the power of the Holy Spirit of God and he used the power of the Word of God. We have that same power. And we see that Jesus was able to stand up even when he faced the full force of Satan's temptation. You know, the truth is, nobody has ever faced temptation like Jesus did. Sometimes somebody will say, well, you know, Jesus faced temptation, but, but he was sinless, so he doesn't know what my temptations are. No, listen, the fact that he faced temptation and did not sin shows that he knows more about temptation than you do. 
Because when you succumb to temptation, then, then you're not learning as much about temptation as when you uphold and stand up under it. When I was pastoring in Louisiana, I had a youth minister at my church. His name was Blake. And Blake was from Texas, and so he wanted to ride a bull. I guess it was something he always wanted to do. And so one Saturday afternoon, Blake found a place somewhere where we lived in Louisiana where you could pay a certain price and you could go and ride a bull. And so that Saturday afternoon, he took a couple of the high school students along with him, and Blake went and rode the bull. He came back the next day. I said, well, how did your bull ride go, Blake? He said, well, it went okay, but I'm pretty sore. And I said, well, how long did you stay on the bull? He said, I stayed on for seven-tenths of a second. I said, seven-tenths of a second? That doesn't seem very long. He said, it seems a lot longer when you're on a bull. Well, Blake knows a lot more about riding a bull than I know about riding a bull. I've never been on a bull, not even for seven-tenths of a second. But if you really want to learn about what it's like to be on a bull, don't ask somebody who's never been on one. Don't ask somebody who's been on one for seven-tenths of a second. Find that guy who has been on a bull for a long time before he gets thrown off. Or talk to the guy who's never gotten thrown off at all. If you want to understand about temptation, don't go to somebody who falls for every temptation that comes his way. Don't talk to somebody who's lived a life of sin and just always is following after temptation. He's never fought temptation long enough to know what temptation is really like. Jesus fought. Every temptation there is. He was tempted in all points, the Bible says, as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ knows all about Satan's temptation. And he knows how to defeat Satan's temptation. And here's the good news. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then Jesus lives in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he will give you his strength, his power, his ability to face up to temptation and win. When Martin Luther was asked how he overcame the devil, here's what he said. He said, well, when Satan comes knocking upon the door of my heart and asks who lives here, the dear Lord Jesus goes to the door and says, Martin Luther used to live here, but he has moved out. Now I live here. When Jesus Christ fills our lives, Satan has no entrance. And through Jesus Christ, we can overcome even the greatest temptations. Join with me as we pray together. Father in heaven, how we love you and praise you. We thank you, God, for loving us. And Lord, you know. You know how we're tempted. Lord, you know when we're tempted to sin in order to provide for something that we think we need. Lord, in those times, teach us, Lord, to trust in you and know that you will provide for us. Lord, you know how we're tempted sometimes to protect ourselves. Lord, we're tempted to to put you to the test so that we'll know that everything's going to be okay. But Lord, teach us to trust you enough that we are always walking by faith in you and we don't put you to the test. Then Lord, you know how we're tempted to promote ourselves, to make ourselves look better or to get something for ourselves that we want. Lord, Teach us to humble ourselves before you, and you promise that you will lift us up and you'll take care of us. Lord, we thank you. Jesus, thank you for facing every temptation Satan had to offer and winning over them. Lord, we thank you that you give us your power. Lord, I pray for that person who's being tempted in some specific area, even tonight. Maybe a temptation to sexual sin, maybe a temptation to lie. Maybe a temptation to walk away from you. Maybe a temptation to mistreat someone else. But Lord God, I thank you that when we are tempted, that Jesus Christ works in us and your Holy Spirit works in us so that we can overcome. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. There are two numbers on our screen. There's one number that you can call and one number that you can text. Listen, if you're watching tonight and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, I want you to know He loves you. He went to the cross and died on the cross to pay the price for your sin. He rose from the grave to give you eternal life, and He promises to save everyone who calls on Him. There's someone waiting to talk to you or somebody who will respond if you text that number on the screen. Listen, let us know how we can minister to you, and especially if you need to know 
what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. Just call and say, I want to be saved or I want to know Jesus. We'd love to talk to you tonight. Again, thanks for joining us. God bless you. Have a great night.